thanks so much uh, to the team at Iconic. Uh, so to Christina and to Sersha, thanks so much for organizing this and for making uh, this platform and this uh, event available. And to everyone who's joining us, let me just have a quick look at the names, Bibian, Chaco, um, Fina, Indran, Jack, Sebastian, Samsung Galaxy S7 as well, Shirley and all. Uh, welcome, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. So uh, let me just move on with the slides. So today we're going to cover this really interesting topic and something which we all as human beings can relate to, uh, mastering the art of conflict resolution and difficult conversations. But before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. So uh, this is a safe environment for everyone. We are all here to learn from one another. I'm not just here to uh, speak at you all, but also here to just share some ideas. So uh, with that being said, uh, do feel free to interact, to engage and to ask questions, right? I do have the chat box open as well. So um, feel free to pop in any thoughts, ideas, anything that's on your mind, any questions as well uh, along the way, or if you want to save your questions, you can uh, unmute yourself towards the end or even put, put it on the chat box. And the next thing uh, which I really encourage uh, all attendees to do is to take down notes. Um, because we think that we have a good memory. But can you actually remember what you did the last weekend? Feels like a long time ago, right? So uh, therefore, it's always good to uh, take down notes, whatever that stands out, uh, any forms of uh, insights or revelations, you want to capture those moments, right? Cool. So uh, one thing, just to get your fingers moving, so pop this into the chat box, all right? So where are you tuning in from at this moment? Right, so I think there's uh, just under 20 of us, so just keen to hear. So Florent tuning in from London, welcome. Shirley from Dublin, Natalie from uh, Vienna, Jack from Ireland, Kate from London, welcome. Chaco from Manila, uh, Sersha, uh, Dublin, Samsung Galaxy Australia, I'm, I'm dialing in from Melbourne, uh, Fina Waterford, BBN Eastwall, amazing, cool. All right, so we do have a very global and uh, international audience. So definitely, um, even though uh, COVID has happened to the world, but the fact that we are able to leverage technologies, it allows us to transcend borders. So thanks so much for uh, popping in your location. The next thing which I'll get you to do along the way during this session is uh, if we've come across uh, a particular insight or revelation, something that really stands out to you, feel free to pop in AHA into the chat box. All right, uh, or if we've covered something which you realize that it's a really big light bulb moment, it could be a reality check, a slap on the face, something which you've done really wrong uh, previously, uh, a big realization, you know, uh, then pop in OMG, all right? So uh, as we go along, definitely keen to hear your responses and reactions to things um, uh, with the, the content and materials. All right, so just quickly about myself, if you're wondering who is this person speaking to you all uh, from the other side of the world. So my name is Dominic and these are some of um, a brief snapshot of my experience. So I had a chance to speak on the TEDx stage twice in Melbourne. Uh, currently I'm also the head of people at culture, uh, people and culture at Dadaradi, which is uh, a sales force or a tech uh, consultancy. I uh, have a chance to speak on the international stage uh, a couple of years back covering uh, different parts of the world, especially uh, Northern Europe and Scandinavia. And that was uh, how I first came across uh, I, iconic offices uh, when I was able to do a resilience workshop for their team in person. So I was featured on a number of outlets. I really love uh, long distance running. So uh, ultra marathon distances of uh, 100 km and above. And also uh, in my professional career, I had a chance to do one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching with a number of clients from EY, Deloitte and Ian Zach Bank. Um, so these are some of the organizations, um, entities, and companies which I've spoken with. Um, so it's always a privilege and pleasure to meet with people from all walks of life, uh, from different backgrounds with uh, diverse ideas and perspectives. Because as much as I'm doing a lot of the speaking today, uh, I'm also, we are here to learn from one another, right? So uh, anything that you have in mind, uh, anything that's, um, uh, that just popped up to you, just feel free to pop it into the chat.
Okay, so this is about myself, uh, but today is all about you and what you can get out of the session. So there are a few things which we want to cover and we do have some activities as we go along just to keep it uh, interactive and engaging. So conflict management. So why do we even need to address conflict management? Uh, we're going to break it down. Um, dissecting and resolving conflict, all right? So as long as humans are around, there will always be conflict and it can actually be a good thing as well. And the second part, the second major part of this session uh, is where we'll talk about handling, um, breaking down and handling difficult conversation. So whether it's in a personal setting, whether it's in a um, uh, relationship or whether it's in a workplace, the professional setting, uh, difficult conversations will likely arise in your career, right? So how do you handle them? What are some of the tools, techniques, and frameworks which you can use, right? So first up, let us look at conflict management. So why do we even need to bother looking at this? The reason is very straightforward. It's because conflicts are part of work and life. As long as there's breath uh, in our lungs, um, there is no avoiding conflict, all right? So because um, where there are different people, different ideas, different opinions, different beliefs, conflicts are bound to happen, all right? So uh, therefore, it's really important for us to be able to manage it. So it's uh, sometimes if you can avoid it, it's good. But at, at times when it's unavoidable, uh, it just boils down to how we are able to mitigate and then manage them, all right? So some statistics on uh, professional conflicts in the workplace. So according to this study by uh, the Myers-Briggs, so they found out that 85% of employees deal with conflict. So which is not surprising. Uh, in the workplace, you might have conflicts with clients, you might have conflicts with your leaders, your managers, your supervisors, your subordinates, the office intern. Uh, you might have uh, conflicts with... Uh, your vendors, your vendors, your suppliers, and all that, all right? So 85% of employees deal with conflict. 29% of them do so always or frequently. So it happens on a very, very frequent basis, okay? And then uh, 2.1 hours per week is spent by the average employee dealing with conflict. So it does actually really add up at the end of the day. So 385 million working hours spent per year um, because of conflict, so in the U.S. workplace, so these actually work. Uh, these actually accumulate to uh, very, very substantial numbers. So you can see that it does have a business and commercial impact, uh, not just on the the companies themselves, but also on people. All right. So these are just uh, the numbers, just to establish the context. So uh, would anyone want to tell? Uh, share with us like what do you think are some of the causes of uh, conflict so we're referring to conflict in the workplace so bad communication so thanks jack anyone else bad communication poor communication what might be causing workplace conflict so uh misunderstanding from lily uh simona taking things too personally yep so sometimes uh, when people say something uh we might just uh, take offense you know you might be triggered uh you might be pissed off uh florin was saying misalignment of goals and values so mismanagement uh discrepancies in expectations so that those are really good ones um Okay, cool. So thanks so much for sharing that. Really appreciate it. So we can see that the primary place, uh, primary causes of workplace conflict, personality, personality clashes and warring egos. All right. So some people might be more extroverted. They might be more opinionated. They might be more verbal and vocal about things, but some others might be more introverted, more uh, quiet more reserved, uh, they prefer to keep to themselves. It's not to say that they don't have a voice or have a say, uh, but sometimes uh, they might be perceived in, a, in an undesirable way, all right? Warring egos. So uh, when people aren't able to manage their emotions really well, uh, when they use, when they're being driven by impulse in the heat of the moment, when they act based on their emotions rather than on uh, intellect and on uh, a sound mind, then things can actually get out of place. Uh, 
So followed by stress and heavy workloads. So when you are under the pump, um, sometimes it's easy to be uh, more triggered. You know, uh, you might take things in a different way. If you're tired, if you're exhausted, if you're sleepy, if you're hungry even. So I know, I think we're doing this during a lunch hour. So if you had a hectic day on an empty stomach right now, you don't have food, uh, you might be agey. So uh, these, these uh, physiological factors do come into play. And the fourth point is uh, culture. So uh, different people from different walks of life uh, have different ways of uh, dealing with conf conflict. So some might be more direct and confrontational. Some might actually skirt around the issues. So if you deal with certain cultures, it might be appropriate to address the issue head on. But if you deal with other cultures, it's actually really rude if you point out the issue, all right? So some other cultures, uh, especially speaking from an Asian uh, ethnicity, uh, sometimes we like to go around the issues. We actually talk about it uh, more indirectly. Uh, we might actually make it more sound more diplomatic, while other cultures, maybe those in the Western world, they decide uh, they prefer to just, uh, just get straight to the point, you know? Don't beat around the bush. So uh, these are some causes. Um, and, and thanks for sharing in a group chat as well. So uh, factors like bad communication, misunderstanding. So especially when uh, you're conveying a message maybe on text or on email, sometimes if it's not phrased well, it can be ambiguous. It can be misconstrued as well. Uh, therefore, communication, clear, concise, and consistent communication is very important. All right. Um, so Simona's point on taking things too personally. So when people are becoming uh, emotionally charged up, uh, it's important for us to manage and to deal with those emotions. And we'll cover uh, de-emotionalization uh, later on in the uh, today's session. All right. So these are some of the primary causes of workplace conflict. All right. The next kind. Uh, the next question is, what do you think are the different types of conflict? So we talked about what causes the conflict. Uh, so right now, this question in the workplace, uh, what are these conflicts about? So what do people get conflicted about in the workplace? Any thoughts? Let's see. Mm, deadlines and workloads. Mm -hmm. That's a very good one. Workloads, mm -hmm. team versus individual objectives. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a very good one. Uh, clashing of interpersonal skills, very nice. Okay, so uh, expectations, beautiful. So some of the different kinds of uh, conflict and uh, you all have mentioned very good points uh, and might be covered in the bullet points here as well. Uh, uh, first of all, task-based conflict. So uh, based on the nature of the work itself, if it's meant to be, if the project task is meant to be in a, delivered in a certain way, but it's delivered in another way, there might be conflict, right? Uh, there could be conflict around leadership uh, leadership styles, leadership management, uh, management styles, all right? So the way uh, the leader treats uh, the subordinates or the way uh, the subordinate uh, views or perceives the leader, that could be conflict as well. Uh, work style. So some people prefer to work uh, by themselves. You know, they have dedicated focus time where they, where they cut everything else uh, out take away all the distractions and just focus on that single task. But some people prefer to be more collaborative. They prefer uh, to be in a setting whereby they can bounce ideas, have a conversation about things, um, just throw uh, different concepts and uh, things up in the air and then come down with something, right? So different work styles. And then back to personality as well. So some people might be more extroverted. Some people might be more outspoken. Some people might be more vocal, but others might be more introverted, more reserved. You know, they prefer to keep to themselves. Um, they, they might share their ideas in a more private setting, but others might just uh, prefer to shout it from the rooftops. Right? Um, workplace conflict on ideas. Right? So whether it's uh, how to service a client, whether it's coming up with a new product, uh, creating a new marketing campaign, uh, as long as there are different ideas, if people don't manage the ideas well, uh, then the conflict can actually be escalated. 
all right, it can actually uh, become a very, very vicious monster if not managed well. But if handled well, um, conflict in terms of ideas and on tasks. So non-people conflict is actually a good thing because, um, because you know, uh, when, when conflict, uh, conflict is basically a kind of like a, a difference in opinions. Right, so people see things from different perspectives, and if handled and managed well, it's a very good thing because that is how we innovate, that is how we push boundaries, that that is how we challenge the status quo. All right, so once again, it's all about how we manage uh, the conflict. All right, so this is all about establishing the basics and fundamentals of conflict, especially in the workplace. Uh, and the next section where, uh, is where we're going to talk about how to dissect and to resolve conflict. So one of the frameworks which I want to share today is this thing called the Thomas Kilman Conflict Mode Instrument. So what this means is, um, depending on the conflict itself, depending on the situation or the scenario, uh, oh, Christopher, no, no worries. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, depending on the situation, um, you might use different styles and strategy to address the conflict, right? So let me just walk you through how this instrument works. Two axes, vertical and horizontal. The horizontal axis measures the importance of the relationship. So the level of, uh, or the degree of cooperativeness, right? So if you're more relational, uh, the more relational approach will go towards the right, less relational, more transactional towards the left. Okay. And then um, the vertical axis is the importance of achieving the goal. So your the level of assertiveness. So if it's really urgent, if it's really pressing, if it's really dire, it will tend to uh, go higher on that skill, on the vertical skill, right? So um, assertiveness, cooperativeness, right? Two axes. So which means there are five strategies, right? So we have avoidance at the bottom left. Uh, bottom right, we have accommodation. Top left, competition. Top right, collaboration. And pretty much in the middle, compromise, all right? So the question you might be asking yourself, and maybe we'll ask the group as well, is what do you think is the best mode? Would anyone want to quickly share uh, what do you think is the best mode? What do you feel is the best mode? Avoidance, compromise, competition, accommodation, collaboration. Okay, so uh, collaboration, yes. So almost everyone says collaboration. So well done. Ah, okay, Florent. It depends on the situation, I would say. That is gold. Okay, so uh, what is the best mode? It depends. It really, really depends. Depends on the severity. Depends on the risks, depends on what's at stake, uh, depends on how pressing it is, uh, depends on the consequences, all right? So every strategy, all right? So every strategy here actually has a part to play and you might actually be using a variety of this whether you know it or not. So let us unpack these as we go along. So the first one is avoidance, right? So avoidance uh, is low on achieving the goal and low on relationships, right? Um, so this is good for very, very trivial issues, all right? So if you're just buying, um, if you're just deciding on where to go for a quick lunch uh, before going to your next meeting, if your colleague wants to go to this place to buy a meal, all right? Uh, and then you don't have time to argue you might just avoid it. Just um, it's not worth the fight. Just suck it up. Just get it over and done with. Okay. So trivial issues. Um, on the other hand, sometimes avoidance um, could occur if you do not know what to do about the situation. So if there's a conflict on a client project, uh, if you aren't comfortable speaking up, if you don't care about the project, if you feel that it doesn't lead to a meaningful outcome, uh, then you might just choose to avoid it altogether and then focus on something else, right? Uh, so some people might even um, 
um, go with avoidance because they lack the ability and willingness to address it. So sometimes they might not even care, they not, might not even bother, they might not even see the point or uh, in dealing with that conflict. So they avoid it altogether. Uh, it could also be a sign of ignorance and apathy. All right. Um, so whenever, so for example, if you're in a position of leadership, if you're managing a team, um, next time, maybe you can use this as a lens whenever your team faces challenges. Uh, and then if you observe the behaviors of your respective team members. So if people are shying away from uh, the issue at hand, uh, and if they are truly avoiding things, so maybe ask yourself, is it because they, uh, they are scared of speaking up? Is it because they have the fear of ridicule or rejection? All right, so um, there could be more deeply seated issues, right, for avoidance, okay? So moving on, next one is competition. So competition is high on achieving the goal, um, but very low on the relationship. So it tends to be almost non-relational extremely transactional competition but there is a space for competition right so fighting for what you want and what you believe in you can fight for a cause you speak up uh, for those who are mistreated speak against injustice so these are really good things you need to push for it that's really good uh, especially the next thing is uh, emergencies and life-threatening situations all right you just need to get the people to the fire exit, right? If the building's on fire, uh, get them to safety, no questions asked, stop arguing with me, just suck it up, obey, follow instructions and get to it, all right? So uh, in the business context, um, if, there's a, if there's a figurative fire you have to put out, uh, so for example, there's a, um, there's a mistake with a, a client project or if the company is going through a restructure uh, or if people uh, are, are facing with uh, critical situations at work, uh, sometimes you just got to make the hard decision and just get it done, all right? Just nip it in the bud, all right? Uh, but competition can be used in a not so good way as well. So for example, when people bulldoze their way through, they throw their weight around, they think that they know it all, they think that um, their, their opinions are the only ones that matter and everyone else is subservient to them. So sometimes this can happen as well if people don't manage their egos well, right? Uh, lacking apathy and concern about others. So if you just want to fight for yourself at the cost and expense of others, uh, then it's not healthy. Okay, so winning at the cost of others are uh, very competitive. All right, so competition, uh, depending on the situation, if done properly for the right use, it's good. All right, uh, but be careful uh, when people are being behaving, uh, behaving very aggressive in the workplace. All right, so that is that one. The next one, the very sweet middle ground. So on the scale, it is middle the middle of uh, importance of relationship and in the middle in terms of the um, assertiveness. So the sweet ground in the middle. So it's all about give and take. So you give up some, I take up, uh, I give up some as well. We walk away with at least something, um, you know, it might not be the best outcome for the both of us, but you know, it's something better than nothing. So definitely negotiations. All right, um, you might work to a comfortable compromise, uh, give and take, All right? So whether it's in your personal relationships, uh, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's when you're trying to work out a deal with a client. So sometimes you just got to come to what's a, a central middle ground, All right? So moving on, the next one is accommodation. Accommodation is very low on achieving goal low on assertiveness, very high on importance of relationships. So this is pretty much where you value uh, the person or you value the relationship more than the goal itself. So sometimes you just let them win the fight because there is no point arguing because um, you don't want to offend them, because you don't want to jeopardize the relationship, you don't want to threaten the friendship, you're scared of offending them. Sometimes that happens. So. Um, Sometimes you might just yield, all right? So you just let them have their way, let them win their argument. Sometimes this is good because um, when, so very similar to avoidance, when 
you feel that there are bigger things at stake. You know, like some people, uh, especially m- maybe on social media, uh, when that, whenever there's a um, hot topic, you know, uh, people can be very vocal and opinionated about things. Uh, they might have certain views on certain matters or uh, certain uh, people of influence. Uh, so let them have their say. Sometimes it's just not worth the argument. All right. So let them have their say. You focus on what you need to do. There's, uh, there's definitely bigger fish to fry. Right, so accommodation is this one. And last but not least, so high on relationships and high on achieving the goal. So this is where we have collaboration, so where we both win. So instead of increasing the size of our pie, we try to increase the size, all right? So size and not the slice of the pie. So this is where strategic partnerships come in. You win. A lot, I win a lot, our customers win a lot. So win, win, win. Uh, but the downside on this is that uh, it is really, really time and resource in intensive. So it might work out in a long haul in the grand scheme of things. Um, for example, like business relationships. Uh, so that is where mergers come in. So if you feel that uh, you can do a joint venture with uh, maybe uh, someone who is offering a complementary product or service to yours, why not? You know, it's good for you, it's good for them, it's good for your customers because your customers can benefit from both products, All right? So, but um, the, the challenge with this is that it definitely takes a lot of time. You need to spend time to con- convince the other party of the value of entering uh, into this relationship. Um, So definitely is more for the longer game, right? But for immediate issues, sometimes if you have time um, to to get buy-in from your your colleagues or from your employees, that's a great thing. Uh, But sometimes in uh, serious business uh, incidents, sometimes you just got to make the tough decision, make the, the, the call and then go forth from there. Because uh, whenever you spend time on like fostering the relationships and all that, there is an opportunity cost um, to you not making that decision straight away, right? So it takes some discernment and wise judgment uh, to, to see which of these five strategies is best for the situation at hand. Okay, so uh, the next one is putting this into context, right? So I think we have an example here. So imagine you moved into the suburbs. You got a very nice, um, very nice house, seemingly very nice neighbors in a very nice part of town. Uh, I can see you got your front turf there, nice driveway, close to schools, close to public transport. Um, close to recreational facilities, the shopping center as well. So really, really nice location. So this is your dream home, but the challenge is you have neighbors. And then you found out that one of the kids or one of the babies from neighbors is really, really crying and wailing all the time. So you have a challenge here. So the scenario we have right now is the neighbor's crying baby because you're working from home. Uh, so you're literally stuck beside a crying child, especially during your uh, work hours. So based on uh, the instrument, which we had a look at, uh, Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument, um, you, there are five ways to approach this situation. All right. So um, would anyone Okay, so let, let's start with them five, uh, one by one, okay? So let's start with avoidance. So if you were to um, use avoidance in this situation, how would it look like? That means the, the baby is screaming and crying and you just choose to avoid. Okay, so Florence saying uh, not to say anything and suck it up, work from your office instead. Okay, so assuming you can go to your office, that's good. But if you are under lockdown, you have to just stay at home. So pretty much you, you just have to suck it up, right? Wear earplugs, exactly. So you just uh, put yourself in your cocoon, isolate, uh, insulate yourself and all that. Okay, so that is avoidance. Okay, so the next one. Uh, so maybe we move on to competition. 
right? So if you want to move, uh, use competition as, as a strategy to deal with this conflict, how would it look like? Would it be fighting fire with fire? <laughs> what if they cry during a call and you can't wear earplugs? Yes. Oh, gosh, that is the danger of avoidance. I mean, there's only so much you can isolate. Um, insulate yourself okay post an email with a warning yes yes so getting a bit more uh, passive aggressive right so competition uh send them a written warning um maybe you you start off with a nice letter first and then you slowly escalate play music super loud yes so if you have a dog get the dog to bark louder than the baby's cry blast music louder than the baby right uh yes you might Blasting music might make the baby worse. So if it, uh, because there's only so, the baby can only cry so loud, but there is no limits to how much you can blast the music. Uh, so you can see that competition has its limitations, right? Uh, cool. So the next one, let's go into accommodation. So if you were to exercise accommodation, how would it look like with the baby situation? So accommodation, once again, is high on relationship and low on um, the uh, goal orientation. So remember, it's more relational. So uh, try to make friends with the parents. Yes, exactly. So uh, you knock on their doors, you say, uh, hey, um, notice that you guys moved in uh, just one, a few weeks ago, uh, but just to let you know that because uh, we're working from home right now, um, uh, the, the baby's uh, crying is really affecting uh, how we are able to concentrate, right? Uh, yep, so it, it's definitely um, the way of diplomacy, all right? Uh, but you never know how your neighbors might react, okay? But that is the strategy, accommodation. Okay, so compromise, how would this look like? So compromise is finding uh, the middle ground where you win some, they win some. Clearly, clearly talking about Houston, we have a problem. Indeed, we have a problem. Um, okay, so maybe compromise could be, you know, trying to work out a deal with the baby, trying to work out an arrangement. So maybe, I don't know, this, this is, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Can we even negotiate with babies? <laughs> maybe that's a give them a gift, say a baby rocker. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe you, you try to give them something to pacify the baby. So maybe that could work. So thanks for that, Lily. Um, number five, uh, collaboration. So how would this look like? So collaboration is high on goal orientation and high on relationship. Which means that uh, you want to uh, achieve the goal on trying to solve the problem, but also working on the relationship. So maybe it could look like speaking to the neighbor and and finding out uh, if the baby's unwell, right? Finding out if there's anything you can do to help with their family situation. Uh, trying to see uh, if there's anything you can do on your end. So obviously, collaboration is kind of like the ideal. But nevertheless, uh, it takes resources, it takes time for you to reach out to them, try to work out something and, you know, all the, all the back and forth and all that, all right, rather than just blasting music on your side, rather than just uh, popping on the, the earphones and um, just focusing on your work and pretending nothing happened. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, so Lily mentioned something, uh, work through a time slot where you really need to be quiet, like a meeting, neighbors take their baby out during your meeting. Yes, yes, so that's really a good one. So letting them know that during these times, I'm on a, a call with my board of directors, really appreciate uh, if uh, you can bring the baby away. Okay, uh, and then BB and saying, recommending a good dietitian. That's a good one. Uh, offer to babysit. Yes, yes, okay, so this is really good because you're building a relationship with the neighbor, they win, you win as well. You gain the baby's trust. So once the baby trusts you, they won't cry or they won't cry, especially when you need to do work, right? So thanks so much for everyone's participation. So that was uh, pretty much how you can use those five um, strategies uh, 
for a, the same situation, depending on uh, how severe or how urgent uh, you deem it to be. Cool, so let us move on. So the next part of this is dissecting and handling difficult conversations. So the, uh, the start of this session, we talked about uh, conflict, the causes of conflict, the different types of uh, conflict in the workplace and how to resolve the conflict uh, using the Thomas Kilman conflict mood instrument. So for this, we are going, shifting gears slightly into difficult conversations. So um, when you want to deal with conflict, you need to address it head on. And many times uh, it means having a conversation with the relevant parties. And usually when that happens, the conversations uh, would tend to be difficult, All right? Cool, so how do, you, do we deal with this? So the first question is, what are the different types of difficult conversations in the workplace? All right, so think about the professional workplace setting. What are some kinds of uh, difficult difficult conversations you might come across, have seen, or would expect uh, to arise, right? So Simona says, asking for a rise. Very good, spot on. Anyone else? What happens during a, pro a period of change? Economic downturn, what does the company have to do? And what kind of difficult conversations come up from those? When times are bad, oh, yes, yes. Uh, make setbacks. Florence says, fire someone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Simona, change is not always welcome. Colleague conflict, very, very good. Okay. So you uh, you all have this really well. Uh, so she saying awkwardness, that, that is true. Yep. So um, when, the, when the, the atmosphere is really tense, how do you deliver bad news, all right? Okay, so different types of co uh, difficult conversations in the workplace. So delivering news on redundancies. So where you are, if you are the manager, you have to let people go, oh, very tough, very, very tough, okay? Uh, if you are an employee, uh, you've done really good work and you, you feel that you're underpaid, under-recognized, you know, asking for promotion or a pay rise, all right? So sometimes that could be difficult um, because we feel bad. Uh, maybe we have imposter syndrome. Uh, maybe we don't know how to word ourselves. Maybe we don't know how to uh, handle possible objections, you know? If you're a manager, uh, addressing the poor performance of your subordinates, right? That is a difficult conversation investigating complaints or misconduct. Uh, so once again, if you're a manager, you heard of uh, some potential issues uh, with your uh, subordinates. Uh, maybe they did something that's inappropriate to someone else, uh, and then it has been raised as a complaint to you, and now you have to investigate, all right? Uh, so definitely we can see some uh, difficult conversations coming up. Reporting a, a grievance or inappropriate behavior. So if you are on the receiving end, or if you are a witness, or maybe even a whistleblower, so raising this uh, might make you feel sometimes uncomfortable, all right? Uh, and also, so admitting to mistakes. So if you've screwed up, if you punched in the wrong numbers, uh, if you conveyed the wrong message to your clients, uh, just admitting that it's your fault, um, just getting to the point, uh, so that is sometimes uh, really challenging. Um, yep, so Kate is saying, telling someone there's a problem with their work. Yes, yes, so giving feedback. So uh, giving and receiving tough feedback, whether it's their work, whether it's uh, the way they carry themselves, whether it's how they treated others, or whether it's their performance, um, it's definitely, uh, it can be very challenging, all right? Cool. So how do we deal with such difficult conversations? So this is where we go into the framework. So it looks simple. Uh, it's good that it's simple um, because the tough part is actually the implementation. Right? So handling difficult conversations, at the base, we have the preparation stage. So that is where you actually prepare the ground. You set the foundations right, and then you go into the conversation where you actually engage the, the person, uh, you reach out to them, you have a dialogue, you work things through, and then 
you eventually reach a resolution. All right. So ideally, the resolution is where everyone walks away um, with a desirable outcome. So uh, like we talk about the collaboration phase, you know, uh, where everyone wins, if possible. All right. Or at least if, if it's a, a suboptimal outcome, at least we walk away having cleared the misunderstanding, having cleared the air, um, being able to still continue to work with one another in a respectful manner. So we might we might not agree on everything, but we can we can agree to disagree, right? So resolution. So preparation, conversation, and then resolution. So let us break these components up. So preparation is actually one of the most important because this is where you set the tone uh, and you must, you must do your preparation, all right? So do not go into a tricky or sticky situation. Do not engage into dialogue straight away if you haven't done the homework and the groundwork, all right? Because you're only setting yourself up for uh, undesirable surprises and even failure. So preparation, identify the purpose. So why do you even need to go into this conversation? What are we trying to actually achieve in the grand scheme of things? Are we just arguing for the sake of arguing? Or are we actually trying to achieve a goal that is bigger than us? Right? Uh, you need to check yourself as well. Uh, because especially if uh, you, you might be emotional, uh, you might uh, be sensitive in terms of your the, the ego department uh, you might be triggered you might be offended so at the point of time you might be very emotional so you really really need to do a, a proper self-assessment right and then you build your case so uh, what is it that you want to discuss uh, what are some of the cards which you want to lay on the table All right and then you can also uh, start to think about what are your negotiables and non-negotiables Okay, uh, this is where you want to clear as much assumptions as possible. So for example, if someone um, has done or said something about your work, all right, uh, and if you've taken it the wrong way, so you really need to check yourself, and then you, you might think that person is actually uh, uh, carrying out a personal attack on you, but maybe that person is just attacking the work and not you. So, uh, so if you fail to actually clear that assumption, you might actually go into that conversation um, with, uh, with the chip on the shoulder. Okay, And then very important also to de-emotionalize. And I'll talk about how you, are actually, how, how you can actually uh, dust off any um, emotional, any outstanding emotional baggage, especially. Okay, So see things from a neutral and objective standpoint. So once again, Put the emotions aside, uh, see things from, a, from the higher ground, take the moral high ground, right? And also try to see things from their point of view. So they might not agree with you on certain things. So ask yourself, why would they think that way? Where are they coming from? Uh, what do they know? What do they see that I do not know? What do they see that I can't see? What do they know that I can't know? Do we have any blind spots? on our side, are we missing out on anything, right? So uh, this is the preparation phase, really important for us to actually um, invest a lot of time and effort in this. So for example, if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna announce um, a company restructure that people, uh, a number of staff members will be losing their jobs. So obviously you need to be very uh, diplomatic about things and also very, um, you need to have a lot of empathy. You need to be sensitive about the situation. Uh, you need to be aware of your tone as well. Okay, so always do the, the, uh, the legwork. So de-emotionalize, let me talk about that one. Um, it's a very cool um, Acronym, so Homer. So whenever you feel emotional about something, you feel heated up, right? So maybe someone uh, got your coffee order wrong, someone cut into your lane. Uh, you need to dust off that emotion before you go into that meeting with your boss or if you're the boss before you have that tough conversation with your, uh, your worker. You need to find space and time to dust off that emotional baggage because if you carry that into the room, it will contaminate the conversation. Right. So, for example, you know, like if you have a tough day at work and if you carry that with you, 
uh, back home, when you're in the living room with your kids, it will rub off to your kids, all right? And likewise, if you had a rough time with your kids in the morning, you know, maybe they piss you off, uh, and then you carry that on into the workplace, when you go meet the clients, it will rub off on them as well, okay? So find ways to de-emotionalize. So how we do that? Hydration and food. If you're really starving, if you're really dehydrated, uh, like we mentioned at the start, there could be a physiological effect on you. So, you know, the phrase hangry, uh, it's true. We are all humans. So sometimes when you're really, really hungry, um, if, if it's possible to defer that conversation or decision, do so, all right? Feed yourself, hydrate yourself, all right? So take care of your basic human needs uh, before you address the bigger issues. Oxygenation, this is really interesting. So what I mean by this is actually your breathing. Um, when people are tense in the heat of the moment, usually their breathing are very short, pulsated and shallow. So it's usually like, <laughs> oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh, we need to do this. We need to get out here. You know, you know, it's, um, it's very, um, it, it's very short and pulsated, all right? So if you feel very nervous, you know, like just before you go on stage uh, to do public speaking, pause and take longer and deeper breath, all right? Because you need to fill your brain and your body with oxygen so that it can think and function properly, right? Oxygenation. M for meditation. So this could mean just sitting down, having some space, you know, uh, like if you're about to go into a mission critical meeting, right? You're really nervous, you're really anxious. So maybe just go into the bathroom, uh, find a private cubicle or go into your car or find somewhere really quiet and private away from people. Have a few minutes of just some space and silence. Right, so you might just want to close your eyes, rest your eyes, rest your mind for a while, uh, just calm yourself down. Okay, so meditation. So sometimes this is really good, especially if you feel like you're trapped in the heat of the moment. All right, thanks so much for joining us, Florin. Definitely, uh, we'll catch you next time. Uh, so the, the next one, E. E is for elevation. So what we mean by this is elevation is always thinking, uh, challenging yourself to think on a higher level. Right? So because in the heat of the moment, we might just hit butt with the other person, uh, but take a few moments to just remind yourself of the bigger picture of why you're doing what you're doing in the first place. So like, are we actually arguing for the sake of arguing, uh, trying to just win the argument, or are we actually trying to solve bigger problems? All right? So see things from a bigger perspective. And last but not least, R is rest. So if you're really tired, you're really exhausted, um, that's why they have this phrase, sleep on it. So if you don't have to make the decision at a point of time, um, just put it aside for a while, make sure you're well rested so that you can think more soundly, right? So Homer, H-O-M-E-R, hydration and food, oxygenation, which is breathing, meditation, getting space, elevation, bigger picture, bigger perspective, R is for rest. Okay, because we are all human beings uh, and sometimes uh, the human side of us can get in the way. Okay. okay, so conversation. So once you've done the groundwork, you have de-emotionalized yourself. You have uh, left your emotional baggage at the door. You're ready to go into the conversation and engage with the other party. So start the dialogue, establish psychological safety. So what we mean by this is uh, sometimes just reminding that person that you know what, this is a safe space. Um, do I have your permission to be open, frank and honest with you? And feel free to do likewise for me as well. So, uh, so sometimes it's just about establishing uh, the context and establishing those boundaries that whatever that's being said in the room stays in the room, okay? And then you acknowledge the problem. You say that, I can see that um, right now the company is going through tough times. Our revenue has dropped by uh, 35 mil in the previous financial year. So um, the management has thought about it. And then we've come to the conclusion that we do actually have to make very tough decisions in order to keep the organization afloat, All right? Uh, attack the problem, not the person. So uh, if, 
if it's a performance issue, address the performance, uh, address the attitude. You know, you can just say that I noticed that uh, when you come to to work, um, the way the customer was being treated on the phone isn't actually the best, uh, and we want to find ways on how that could be dealt with better. Okay. Use simple language, avoid jargon, keep it as straightforward, as unambiguous as, as possible, uh, and then uh, seek first to understand, then to be understood, uh, and then uh, if you're unsure, always seek to clarify, ask them to rephrase it, don't assume things. All right. Uh, so observe body language as well. So if you're entering a conversation, uh, are you going in with your hands folded? Are you going in looking very stern and angry? Or are you actually positioning yourself as being open and approachable? And then uh, depersonalize if possible. So depersonalization is also a very handy trick, just like de-emotionalization. So let me just uh, cover briefly. So when you try to depersonalize the, the, um, the conversation, um, so these are just some examples and you can note and start to see the subtle difference. So a very personal um, way of saying things is, for example, why didn't you send a document to me? So it's actually kind of like hitting the person directly. Uh, if you want to depersonalize it, it'll be, I noticed that I didn't receive the document. Okay. Or you can even ask them, has the document been sent? So you actually take the person out of the equation. So you do not use the words uh, you. Okay. Uh, and then the, the next example, could you respond to me quickly next time? Um, so how this can be finessed is uh, if this can be actioned uh, more quickly or this can be responded to quickly next time, that will be great. Okay. So you take that person out. Uh, and then number three, have you read the manager's email? Uh, so this is a bit more gentler, even though it's still mentioning that person. So did you get the chance to read the manager's email? Okay, so notice that we are still addressing the problem, but we are trying not to attack the person. Okay, so use this smartly based on the situation uh, you're in, right? So the more tools you have, the better it is because when you use things which are very um, like more personal, uh, it people, in the, especially in the heat of the moment, uh, can actually be aggravated by this. So if you ask them, so for example, if they're really pissed off uh, and edgy and you ask them, why didn't you send a document to me? Uh, they could be offended. They could take it the wrong way. They could be aggravated or antagonized. It doesn't help the situation, okay? So this is just one other handy trick you can have. Uh, and the last step is the resolution. So you have the conversation and you're working to the best outcome. So ensure that all of the cards are laid on the table before proceeding. Think win-win as much as possible. Discuss possible alternatives, work towards an outcome, and check the other party is on the same page as well. Okay? So ensure that they are on the same wavelength uh, with you, um, and you try to agree on something as much as possible. Okay? So this is the resolution part. All right, so as we wrap things up, so we've covered a lot. Uh, we talked about conflict, the nature of conflict in the workplace, uh, how to deal with conflict with that model. Uh, we talked about difficult conversations. So as a wrap up, conflicts and difficult uh, conversations, they are unavoidable. They are part and parcel of work and life. They are perfectly normal, inevitable. All right. Uh, however, they are actually essential for growth, innovation, and development. Because if two people think alike, then actually one of them is not really necessary. Uh, it's the divergence and the vibrance variety of our thinking that makes us unique as human beings. And it is actually how we can progress society and humankind. It builds character and maturity because if you can manage conflict well, if you can handle tough conversations, uh, it actually builds up your resilience, it builds up your uh, communication skills, builds up your, um, your grit, you know, and how, at the end of the day, it's also how we handle them that is the most important. 